Okay, so we uh, we get ready to bring up our last speaker uh, speakers of the night. Uh, we're going to be talking about Jamie's second most uh, important strategy, which is uh, U.S. Par property. He spoke a little bit about that on yesterday, and uh, we're going to bring up uh, one of the persons who is, uh, I guess, spearheading that. Uh, you heard us speak earlier today, and uh, welcome to the stage one more time, Lou Hardy. Have we got volume? We got volume. Who's feeling tired? Who just ate and is feeling bloated? Who's been into Fiverr? I've just posted a job on Fiverr, so I'm happy to give someone five bucks to come and do this presentation for me. <laughs> okay, so this one, we don't have to go through a lot of um, uh, some of the detail we went through earlier, so we can get straight into some gutsy content. So. If at any time you're feeling a little tired or you're feeling a little lethargic, I need you to just sit upright in your chair and take some hollow breaths, so deep breaths just to sort of keep the blood flowing. Um, because this is, uh, this is a bonus session. Um, this is just one of our businesses. We've got many of our members that are US property investors or Australian property investors. Many are already land, landowners, land banking. Um, and as Eric said, US property is, is Jamie's second on his top 10 investment strategies. Now, this has to be, without a doubt, uh, one of the, the fastest and the biggest cash flow generator strategies that we've got currently at the moment. And it's US property. So everybody understands what happened in the GFC and the, and the toxic mortgages and the banks collapsing, right? So what we're doing now is we're benefiting from that crash. Okay. Now, because we live in a land where we're resource rich and we've got access to funds, it is so much easier for us to invest overseas. The only reason people don't invest overseas is because they're, fear, they're fearful, they don't know the areas where to invest, um, and they don't understand offshore investing. Whereas this is just one of the services that 21st Century has, as I said, it's part of the, the 12 different groups of uh, companies that we have. So today, what we're going to go through is what the US property division does, who we are, how we actually buy and invest in the US. I'm going to introduce you to the US property core team, and I'll bring Joel up after to do that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to show you some stock that has recently been sold. We've sold about 300 houses in the last 18 months, um, and we've got plenty of houses that just keep coming through, probably about 10 to 15 a fortnight. Now what happens, I just want to give you sort of a nutshell of how, what we actually do. We'll go through the property solutions, and many of you will get to book in for an appointment with myself, Joel, or Kartik tomorrow um, between 10 and 1. So if you have to leave, book an appointment if you really want to sit, if you're seriously looking at investing. Obviously, priorities will be people who have self-managed super funds, because we have a lot of clients that buy and self-managed super funds, people who've got access to equity in Australia, cash, um, but we also have finance models, both here in Australia and also US finance lenders. So what we do in a nutshell is, after the GFC, we set up a, a group of partners in the US that have got 18 years experience with real estate. So Jamie and his pulling power and the leverage that he has was able to establish these relationships. Also establish relationships with titles companies, with builders, with uh, US tax lawyers, with accountants, with property sources, with actual banks, etc. So we can either buy the houses, foreclosed houses, directly off the US banks themselves, right? Or we use our property sourcing team that actually are locals that live in the US on the ground that have been, you know, 15 to 18 years experience. Some of you may, may see them in the DVDs that we gave you today, or you can look online on our websites, Ben and Tyler. They're the people that we give set KPIs and they find and source the properties in the areas that we would expect to invest here in Australia. So similar fundamentals. So we've got properties that were average, maybe 60, 70, 80, uh, sorry, 60, 70, 80,000 is the average price of a house that we've got. Their true market value may have been 150, 200,000. And after the GFC, that crashed. So people go, oh my God, this is just unbelievable. So imagine wherever you currently live right now, and your house is around 500 to 800,000, then something has happened, the global crisis has happened, and suddenly your homes in your street are now suddenly down to 100K. Isn't that, can you not, I can't even fathom that if that happened in this country. 
but it was a, a it was a, a definite thing that happened over there, um, and it was something like 30,000 30, houses a week were getting uh, uh, taken back by the banks. Right now, here in Australia, if that happened, we'd have to actually still pay the mortgage off. Even though we might have bought the, may have bought the house for 800000 it's now worth two hundred. we we'd still have to pay our $800,000 mortgage. Whereas over there, they didn't have to. That's why it's called jingle mail. They just walked away, right? Because it's the bank's fault. It's not their fault. So the people didn't leave. They just, they just lost their houses. So they still need to live somewhere. Now, when you're talking in a population of 300 million people, right, you're actually helping them out. We're actually driving the economy. We are like the number one of investors in the US market, second to China, which is a big thing, right? So I'm going to show you what, what it is we actually do. And it's a complete service. My job is not to convince you to buy these houses. If you're smart enough, you will recognize this opportunity for yourself, OK? Um, and then we'll bring Joel up, and he's going to show you the houses that we've got now and the ones that that um, have sold recently. I, Jamie's got a number of them. Joel's got a, got a few of them. I've bought four of them. Most of our team have bought them, only because it's a no-brainer, right? These are houses, like I, my last house was $58,000, right? My first one I bought was $42,000, and I paid cash, and I get 21% net return, something like $1,100 a month return, right? You do it on your credit card. You just do it any way you can do it, because the window's closing. We've been doing this for 18 months. 18 months ago, we took a team over with our platinum team. They travel and have a holiday with us. Then we took them on a Caribbean cruise for 10 days. After that, we then got off the ship and went across to Phoenix, Arizona. Back then, Phoenix, Arizona was the only state that we'd actually invested in. Um, and the pro average price for a home was about $80,000, $90,000. Since then, um, the property prices have gone up. You know, in Phoenix, it's gone up like by 12% over the last 12 months. So some people that bought properties there and then flipped them to other people, right? Some have kept them. So you've got, you've got the long-term capital growth, but you've also got long-term cash flow for life. And this is a really strong cash flow strategy. Like all of our strategies, we don't say just buy land or just buy US or just do a business. It's about having a managed, diversified portfolio of strategies. Okay, so some of you will have a couple of land blocks. Then you may look a couple of months later to buy one or two US properties. Then you may look at later doing a business. Then you may look at doing a financial trading strategy, whatever it is, and then getting it all structured. And the way we do, it, do this is you decide which property you want. You tell me how much money you've got to spend. You'll, you might say, okay, I've got 80 grand in cash, I'm ready to go. I will give you three or four different properties in the areas that we'll cover today. You go, I actually like this one, this one's 15%, this one's 18%, or this one's whatever. So we're going to show you cash flow areas, such as Kansas, Indianapolis, where we've got a lot of properties. So they are lower capital growth. As long as you understand that, it's lower. If it doesn't go up for five years, I don't care. But if I'm getting 15 to 20% guaranteed rental returns, I'm happy. Or you can go to, if you're more for the hybrid model that has got good capital growth, that also has a nice 14, 15% cash flow return. Um, you know, you can do that. So there's a lot of different areas. Hopefully one of the, one of the sites, one of the, the areas will suit you. Um, and we're going to cover four, four different uh, countries, uh, counties and states. But the way we buy them, we buy them off the bank. We refurbish them, right? If they need renovation, we renovate them. We put carpet, we give them a lick of paint, we'll fix up the wet areas. We will then find the tenants, we'll put the tenants in, we'll, we'll get the building inspectors in, so you get a building report, a pest report, set up the titles companies, we'll set up the US bank accounts for you. We'll also set up the US tax IDs to make it a, a legal way for you to purchase this, and the way we purchase it is not in our personal name. We open up a US limited liability company, and the LLC, which is an LLC, and the LLC will do the work for you, and that's how it's purchased in that. Now, you can do that yourself, or some people like Jamie says are too lazy and want someone else to do it. I'm lazy. I don't, didn't want to fly over there. I didn't want to go, where am I going to land? Where am I going to fly? Right? So you might as well use a company that you trust. Now, the reason that the 21st century has been in business for 14 years is because Jamie's stuff works. He's a visionary. He finds the latest cutting edge strategies just for our members. And if you want to do these strategies, you do them. If you don't, it's no skin off our nose. Now, we recently just um, got back from the US virtually a week ago. Some have come after me. We did a two-day US boot camp. We take our clients across every year. There was about 38 clients. This is Ken Gillespie 
And we, after we educated them on where to buy, where not to buy, what to avoid, you know, met all the professionals, two days in Vegas, then we took them on a three city tour, right, in the areas that we actually purchased the homes in. And we showcased them. They got to touch, they got to feel, they got to smell them. Look at these houses. These are just beautiful. So they got to go and feel what their investment is. Now these houses are like, this one's like about 80 to $100,000. That at market peak was like 300, 350, right? So it's being able to recognize an opportunity. You're at the bottom of the market again. People go, oh, what happens if the market crashes? Wow, it's already crashed. It can't really go much lower. If it goes down another five or 10 grand, whoop de doo The thing is, recognize it for what its current market, its previous market, uh, pre-GFC value was, right? There's another one. And on our website, uh, you'll see lots of videos with Joel talking to the clients as he's going through. You've got the real estate agent discussing the actual type of property and the age of the property and the location and, you know, all the fundamentals that you would expect, you know, the industry that it has, et cetera. Um, that's a nice duplex there, right? So you've got, I like duplexes. Duplexes are two, two, two houses in one. Because if one tenant leaves, then you've still got cash flow, right? Coming in, okay? So that's a quite a nice little place. That's the group that we just took. I think uh, Nick's here, isn't he? He may have gone. So we've got some members that are actually on that trip with us, so you can speak to them while we're here. This is one of my houses. My husband goes, oh my God, they're so ugly, that house. I said, you don't have to live in the house, baby. I said, you stay here living in Williamstown because I paid 50G for it. It gives me 950 rent. My annual tax is 900. The gross rental return is nearly 23% and the net rental return is 1750. If you can find how to get that from somewhere here in Australia, let me know, okay? That's just crazy, okay? So as I said, most people buy the first one cash because they can pull 20 or 30,000, or sorry, 30 to 50,000 from somewhere, from loans of credit, equity, et cetera. Or self-managed super fund, that's pretty sexy these days. A lot of people are purchasing real estate through their self-managed super fund. Just understand that there is a fees associated with that and you can't spend the, the takings until you're like 215, okay? When you retire, okay? So that was a joke. <laughs> okay, cool, I just wanna make sure you're awake. Okay, so what are, what are the reasons we do it? There's no stamp duty. Properties are already sourced, they're already renovated. Properties that were previously 250 are selling now for, for 50,000. You could even go home and do your own due diligence and you could see this for yourself. You don't need to travel to the US to select properties. What happens is they come up, a list comes out, our members always, get, our platinum members get first preference. They might get two or three houses to look at. They virtually have 72 hours to make a decision. They lock the finance in, their limited liability company set up, and that's how they purchase. If you um and ah and think about it, it's gone. It's sold from under you. I had a client the other day who enrolled into the membership on the Thursday. She pulled $56,000 out of her uh, line of credit, and then we went to fill out the paperwork, but Joel already had, had been speaking to a client who just was in there, you know, maybe two hours before. That's how quick they go, because they are super cheap. Now, this is our Australian team. These guys live in, in Kingsway. They're in Kingsway. So you're going to meet Joel in a minute. He's the US manager, US property manager, runs the, the, the US property division, and he's the expert on all things real estate. He's got, he'll tell you all about himself in a minute. Now, admin is Sunny Sunny. What a cool name, Sunny Sunny. His job is to make sure that the process is done right, that your bank accounts are set up properly, that the limited liability company is set up properly, etc. So he walks you through the process. And Kartik is our senior financial analyst. So those people are really number crunches and really need to know the nitty gritty of the numbers. You can speak to Kartik. Uh, he's also um, helped source some of the properties. And he's the one who sets the KPIs for our US suppliers. Okay, so if we need a certain amount of properties, that's what Kartik uh, is responsible for. Now, these are the guys that are actually work with us in the US, Ben, Tyler, and Rihanna. Uh, so they're the property managers, they're also the property sources, they're the ones who go and do the negotiations with managed funds, with um, banks, etc. They allocate properties uh, and then fix them up. 
If they need renovating, they're the ones who do, do, do all of those properties up and then give them to us. Now, Jamie buys all of the properties. So worst case scenario, a client pulls out, then Jamie's still receiving all of that. All 21st century group keeps these properties. But as I said, they go through pretty quickly. Now, we have already heard from Stephen why we love investing in Australia, right? Australian economy and our real estate has always done very well for us for the last 20, 30 years, right? So we're not saying do not buy or continue to invest in Australia, of course you do, but also look at a cheap alternative for getting a continual, ongoing, lifetime cash flow strategy. Now, let's have a look at the main benefits. Why do people do it? One, capital appreciation. So it's at the lowest levels. So you will get capital growth. If a house was 30, 300,000 and it's now 50, 60, 70,000, we expect that it will, it will rebound. Now, if you've read the news, you will already see that this has already started to increase. You know, construction in the US has picked up by 26% just in the last 12 months. Now, if there's more people building houses, what sort of you know, effect is that having on the, the locals, do you think? That's positive, right? So consumer, consumer sentiment also increases that. Another thing you need to consider is the currency fluctuation, right? We are at the strongest dollar that we've been for a long time. So the Australian dollar, what, for the last couple of days has been hovering around 103 to 105, right? So you're going to already um, make a profit just on the exchange. So the, the last house I, I used the fi the, that I purchased, I used the finance model, which um, Doll's going to talk about, where I put up 50% finance. The house was like 50-odd thousand, paid 25,000. The Australian dollar at the time was around, it had gone from $1.06, and then I, over the time, me organising my own funds and finance and trying to pull money in here, there and everywhere, by the time I went to transfer it into a, a, a foreign exchange account here in Australia to lock in the current rate, it was down to 97 cents. And I went, oh. So then Joel's going, come on, Lou, we need your money so we can get this uh, transaction going, so we can give you the property. Blah, blah, blah. And I said, oh, yeah, I'm just being real. But really, because I'm a, a currency trader, I knew that the market was going to rebound back up, and I delayed the process for a couple of days. And when it hit 304, uh, ooh, imagine that, <laughs> 304, um, $1.04, that's when I transferred the money across and got what? an extra two grand or $1,800 just for knowing when to, to make that transaction. So it is being smart about your investments. Now, not only that, the foreign exchange, but also the high cash returns, and we're going to show you houses that um, have, you know, some of them in the past were right up to 22% gross, right? And some of them now are around the 20%, 19%, 20% gross, 15 to 16% net return. What's Australian property returns? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's four to six percent, right on a half a million dollar house. Yeah. Okay, rental appreciation as well. So just look at some of the stats. US property was the all time history low, the worst crash in US history, as we know. Over seven million homes and people were forced out of their homes. They lost their homes. Can you imagine that? Seven million people lost their homes. Right? That's equivalent to Melbourne and Sydney metro areas combined. Okay, this crisis created 300,000 foreclosures per month. And we haven't seen anything like this since the 1930s, since the Great Depression. And they plummeted from three to 400 down to, like in 20, down to 40,000 in, in 30, 30 months. So Americans have walked away. There was a big swing towards rentals. Banks, they stopped lending. So when the banks dry up because they've got no money, then people obviously have got nothing to do except foreclose on their home. Strong Australian dollar and Warren Buffett. Who listens to Warren Buffett? Most of you should listen to Warren Buffett because he's like the second or third richest man on the planet. And, we, and he predicted this. We usually follow uh, whatever Warren says. We're pretty close behind. Now, this is uh, the first week in November. You can just Google this yourself. You can get on and have a look. Type in US housing market into Google and, and just see for yourself, right? Spend the time and just have a look. US finance, uh, finance are recorded nearly three billion quarter profit. The company benefited from rising house prices. Time is running out to buy your dream home, US economists warn. Now is likely a good time to buy 
US real estate in regions relatively low foreclosure rates. So wherever you go, US markets set for strong recovery, says Goldman Sachs. US chart that starts to leap in almost th three years. You know, I could just keep rattling on, but the, this is just standard media that's available. Rose three, three uh, this is building, 3.6% in July. Foreclosures are slowing in many regions. Single family home rentals have gotten so hot that institutional investors are racing to raise money to buy foreclosed homes. US housing market recovering, but price still modest. All right, so all of these things are showing indications of price rising. So back there, this, this may not be available for the next 12 months. After 12 months, 12 to 18 months, we may not have the opportunity to invest in the US anymore. Because once the banks start landing back to the locals, they start buying back their houses, then there'll be nothing for us to, to uh, invest in anymore because the prices will be just too high. And then we just might as well just invest in Tasmania for the similar prices. So if they go up to two or 300,000, right? So it is a very short win window of opportunity. Um, we're surprised it's lasted this long. This is an Australian paper. We see properties over there where you're getting a genuine net yields of up to 15%. Australian investors often hold several properties in their self-managed super funds. So and it is a leverage way. So let's look at Warren's doing lately. Uh, it's just made a huge bet on the US market, uh, housing market. He also is responsible for whether the market goes up or down, do you believe, do you think? Right, just what he says can actually turn the tides of what, what people are investing in. Um, and he's buying up in uh, real estate brokerages around the country, which also actually gives more heat to the fact that the prices have already started to rise. Um, so what we do is let's have a look at some of the categories that we look at investing in. So when you're looking at investing a house, you probably already like the idea of having capital growth, you know, or cash flow. So you've got to dec decide which one you want to do, or you can do both. So capital growth areas were such as Phoenix and Atlanta, Georgia, that we used to invest in. Cash flows offer high rental returns of 15 to 20%. Now, Joel's going to go through these shortly. Kansas City, Missouri, Indianapolis, right? They're some of the areas and the, and the properties that we're going to show you, the ones that we've just re recently sold, but also the new ones that he's got. You may want a mix and a hybrid. So you've got a bit of capital growth and you've also got a bit of cash flow. We also show you areas that are pending. We haven't totally ruled them out. They could be possible emerging markets, but we'll also show you, um, which is Dallas, Texas. We've been sitting on that for a little while and now we've actually invested in, in, started investing in there. Why? Because we just waited for a few fundamentals to change in that housing market. And once it did, then we're ready to uh, take, um, take our clients to Dallas, Texas, which is a beautiful, beautiful part of, the, part of the world. We'll also show you places not to buy in, right? Empty cities such as Detroit, Baltimore, Vegas. Vegas is like the Gold Coast with the up and down fluctuation of the housing and tourist industry. So, you know, you do have, you've, ha you've heard stories of people that need Kevlar's and nine mil pistols to go and collect their rent. That doesn't happen here because we actually got into this a little later than probably some other Australian companies because we actually learn from the lessons or, or the mistakes that previous companies have made and we, and we want to make sure that when we're ready to do this that, um, that all bases are covered. So when you are looking at investing, these are some of the categories that we're going to teach you um, where to go. Now let's have a look at the areas that we target. Okay, here's a picture of the US um, map. On the left here we've got Phoenix, Arizona. Okay, so this is in California. You've got California here. Phoenix, Arizona. Then we zoom over to the center there, Kansas City. Then across to Indianapolis, Atlanta, Georgia, and just recently in Dallas. So three of these areas, these are the five areas we've invested in. We do move because, as I said, the price it goes up, so we move. There's no point getting in there because most of our clients like that 60 to 120 price range. When it starts going higher than that, um, we look for other areas that still have that high cash flow um, component. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going, to, um, I'm going to bring Joel up because Joel is, as I said, Joel is a driver of this division. He is so knowledgeable in everything related to US property. In fact, he actually has taught me everything that I know now about it, but also the fact that we both walked through it. So if you decide to invest in this, what we've done, 
you, you'll do the same. So it's much easier when you do have hiccups with this or with that, then we'll be able to rectify that quite easily. So he's the expert on all things. So ladies and gentlemen, let's give him a nice welcome to the stage, Mr. Joel Dobson. I'll come back at the end. Thank you for the intro music, by the way, Mr. Maestro, that's outstanding. Um, so I'm Joel Dobson. Um, most of you who have spoken to me, I think one or two of you have, know that I've got a very warped sense of humour. Um, I've been surviving on limited sleep, so just bear with me. This is going to be a lot of fun. Just a little bit about myself. I don't like to talk to m about myself too much, but just so you know who I am, um, I'm reasonably young. Um, I'm a Pisces. I do enjoy walks on the beach and blue strolls. No, no, I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur, as that word goes. I actually studied entrepreneurship at RMIT years ago. I've studied psychology. I've studied e-commerce. I've studied business. I've studied so many different things. I'm even confused about what I understand, what I know. Even architecture. Um, my family's been in this country since the Third Fleet, and we've owned such large parcels of Australia, you could almost call it Tasmania. Um, we have obviously evolved into a... Uh, more of a global sense, and around about 2000, 2001, we started buying overseas because we all of a sudden saw that there was not just opportunity here at that time, which was just bounding, but also opportunity around the world. We actually bought our first properties in the US in 2004. So we have actually survived through the GFC to a point where we have still to this day actually made hundreds of thousands of dollars on those assets without even doing anything to them. Um, my real role apart from obviously making sure everything hums together and all that you lovely people obviously have someone to lean on, is that I actually train you how to do what I do. Um, I've been doing this for a lot of people around the world for many years. I was uh, brought onto 21st century ideally in an Australian property market side because my background in the Australian market is as a mortgage and finance broker. Now, usually people throw things at me at this point, but I say former mortgage and finance broker. The reason I say that is because I wasn't actually the guy you'd talk to to get a loan. I actually set up a retail division that did that, but I was the guy that actually gave your bank the money to give you the loan. So I was what they call a wholesale cash funder. So from this perspective, I can show you exactly how you can get funds anywhere in the world at any time for anything. You just have to be prepared how to pay for it. More interestingly, I can actually get you funding in the US, which I'll touch on in a little bit, um, but it won't impact your Australian credit score. So there's a number of different things that we'll touch on here today. I'll try and get through it as quickly as possible. There's a saying that uh, a very, very nice man actually said at one of the first seminars I went to for 21st century, which is the mind can absorb as long as the butt can endure. And you guys have been sitting all day, so let's just see how we go. A couple of points. We started off, uh, as Lou mentioned, in Phoenix, Arizona, about 18 months ago, because it was one of the booming markets at the time. Um, at that stage, we were looking at entry points that were between seventy and ninety thousand dollars. The actual hitting point, obviously, was hitting about eight to ten percent. Now, as Lou touched on before, and I think one or two people in the audience knew this, the average actual return on an Australian property is about three or five percent, if you're lucky. Commercial is a different animal. Residential investment, about three to five percent. So you're looking at capital growth market. I can get that for you in the US. We don't deal in Phoenix anymore. What we were buying previously for about the 70 up to 100K mark, we've recently sold for 120 up to $160,000. That's less than 12 months period of holding. Okay, and if they reinvest that, there's also some methods obviously to alleviate any capital gain, which is something obviously in Australia that we absolutely detest, or I do. Um, this is an example of one of the properties that we picked up. Now, the interesting thing is, just a quick show of hands, if anyone's got any blood circulation left, who's been to the States? Okay, I'm sorry and welcome back. Good for all of you. <laughs> you know that obviously we get certain perspectives of types of property. There are certain environments which have been around for a long time. Some cities have only been around for less than 100 years, yet they're even larger than Melbourne. Okay, so just the construction methods obviously will, will vary from city to city. And you'll see some of that when I touch on some of the properties. In Phoenix, you get this sort of stuff, which is basically a stucco house with rendering. That's it. Heavily insulated to keep, you, keep basically the heat out because it's about 40 degrees in the winter there at some times. Um, it, it's market peak, 218,000. We sold it for about 90. Right now, you could probably sell this for about 140, nudging up to 150. Okay, it was also hitting 9% net. Now I'll touch on the net or the gross to net yield calculation a little bit so you can actually understand how we come to that, uh, come to that figure. But the key of it is as well is to understand there is a, a lot of effort that goes into identifying this as a valid investment for you. Because as Lou also said, if I don't buy it, Jamie doesn't buy it, or one of our US property members doesn't buy it, we're gonna have to keep that for anywhere up to two decades. So we're not gonna buy lemons for the sake of holding fruit. We're literally gonna be looking for investments ourselves. 
okay? Another property, I'm gonna try and flick through these sold ones as a bit of an example. What members get, and we sell to hedge funds, we sell to a lot of different entities around the world, um, simply because of the buying power we have. We represent about a quarter of a billion, anywhere up to a half a billion dollars worth of buying power by a cumulative membership base. So we're very, very impressive to a bank that wants to offset a lot of its defaulted stock or any of the tax lien property that we also take up as well. These sort of properties obviously, is a, it's designed as a capital growth market, so it's what Australians are generally used to. Okay, and tonight I'm not actually gonna show you any of our best and prettiest and cheapest properties, I'm just gonna give you average run of the mill. Okay, just to give you a realistic example of what we actually get into. Kansas City is one of the cities we went to recently on that tour that, uh, that Lou mentioned. Now, Kansas City, most people think of uh, Dorothy Toto and uh, all the other uh, unfortunate events that happened in that beautiful black and white color movie. It's actually on the border of Kansas and Missouri. The best part of Kansas City sits in Missouri. If you bought a property in the state of Kansas, you've just lost $20,000 no matter what because they're in a different tax system, they're in a different type of legislature depending on tax, uh, to the state laws. It's a different realm altogether. Just that bit of knowledge probably just saved you 20 grand, okay? There's a lot of reasons why you could obviously pick a great property in this city or be really stung and not make your money back for up to two decades. We're looking at purchase prices here about $34,000. It's not a high demand market, so you're not actually looking for capital growth. It's a high rental market, which is why we're actually sustaining 20% net positions out of this city, okay? One of the properties that we actually sold in Kansas City, we picked up for about 51K. Now the market peak here, you see that at 86, that isn't at the height of the GFC, okay? Because obviously everybody knows what a hyperinflated market is and obviously a market correction in regards to property cycles. So let's say we're doing this. This is basically hyper demand because what would have happened here is a realistic growth cycle obviously would look something like that, where it's gonna be long and sustainable. Oh, horrible. This is what a guy who just got off 40 hours worth of flying just looks like. Um, okay, so pretty much what we're also gonna be looking at doing in this sort of a scenario is identifying when the best time to buy is and obviously when the best time to exit. Exit, obviously. Exit, exit, potentially. You're actually saving yourself a little bit of time and money. You get into an environment that's obviously got consistent long-term patterns, you're actually in a safer position to do so. <clears throat> Wherever there's a market correction, such as obviously where it's basically gone above the bubble, you're basically ensuring that you're not gonna be hyperinflating your purchase price. Basically what that means is you don't wanna get in switch to a situation when it's down here, you bought here, how long do you think it's gonna take you to recover to this point here? Five, 10, 15, 20 years, never? Depending on obviously the environment that it's in. In the hyperinflated market, let's say 2006, 2005, 2001, Okay, so this is pretty much what you'd base it as a realistic estimate of what the property was worth before it actually started getting hyperinflated because of the greed factor in the marketplace, before poor market practice, obviously, for finance. Lending was going out the door. Anybody didn't even have to have a heart rate could get a loan, and I'm not kidding. They were giving uh, basically auto-approved loans to just about everybody. That's one of the reasons we're able to pick up these properties. Now, when I'm actually giving you these examples, that's what it's sold for in these set of points, not this point. Okay, that's important to note. We could have sold this property at this point for over $100,000. But if I illustrate that to you, that's not gonna be realistic. Moreover, some of these properties have never sold. They've been in the same family for the entire duration of its construction. Some of the properties we've had since 1890, that's when they were constructed before power tools. So there's a range of factors we obviously use to deduct what's gonna be a valued asset for our portfolio and more importantly for our members if they decide to go with it. This property conservatively, 15.54. Three bedroom, two bathroom. I'll touch on that real quick. The reason we get into this sort of a style, and you'll see a lot of these coming through, three bedroom, two bathroom, one bathroom, target demographic in the areas we get into, okay? It's all well and good. You can buy a property on eBay for a dollar. Guarantee right now, I'll pull it up for you and we can all bid on it, it'd be fun. The thing about it is, what's the point in doing that if you haven't got a tenant to get in there? That's the hardest part, okay? Exit strategy is an exit strategy. Hang on to that long enough, your kids can sell it and make a profit. If you can't get a tenant into that property, it's worthless. So you need to be attracting the right type of tenant. In this area where this property is, are the best schools, best shopping center, best logistics, best infrastructure, everything's there. There's no highway extensions, there's no railway extensions, there's no commercial district, there's no drug and alcohol rehab centers. It's a good area, it's a family area, and it's what the tenants in this city are looking for. Therefore, you've got the lowest vacancy rates. In certain parts of Kansas right now, you're looking at about 9.2% vacancy rate. Okay, that's pretty high considering obviously in Australia, we're sitting around about the three to five in some areas, depending on how you look at the numbers. In this section of the city, just under 2%, because these are the properties they're looking for, 
Okay, there's a lot of factors that actually contribute, obviously, to getting into these properties. This property actually was a, a design for a different matrix. Some of the tenants that we actually attract, two bedroom, one bathroom, single, young, professional, retired, certain demographic that obviously is a certain component of the market that we get into. However, this property is what we call a section eight. Okay, now section eight is government housing. Now, the second I say that in Australia, most people freak out. There's no need to do that. In the US, you want a section eight tenant because what it realistically means is the government's gonna pay you up to 90% of the rent no matter what. Your tenant moves out, they can just pick up and leave or pass out and go somewhere else. Whatever the situation, the government still pays you rent no matter what, okay? And they're very effective in doing this. Every single month, guaranteed, in comes the rent. There is currently a waiting list to be a Section 8 tenant up to three years. You have a backlog of tenants dying to get in there. So not only do you have an environment where you've got, let's say, you pick up a type of property. This, for example, are all of the potential renters in the market. Don't put me on screen again. Okay, so these are all the potential renters in the market. 50%, let's say, is what you can get with the first property that we had a look at. Because you're gonna get Section 8, you've just increased it to, let's say, 60% of the potential tenants in that city that will come in to rent your property. The other market is probably looking for something else that we don't get into, a type of a condo, for example, maybe a, a McMansion, whatever it might be. Purchase price on those might be too high for what we can actually attain as a net return. But by just increasing your potential, obviously, for reducing your biggest risk in this investment, which is vacancy, by strengthening it with the government, US government paying back the rent, it's a pretty good place to be. Another interesting property, three and two and a half, obviously 2.5, meaning there's just what they call a washroom, a toilet in the corner. That's pretty much what it is. It has its own room. It's not literally in the corner. Um, this is 10.89 as its net, net return. It's estimated market peak on this property. You'll see that 90, but we sold it for 73,100. And this is as competitive as we can get them. 90 was the sales price four years after it was built. Okay, that's not a bad deal at all. These properties, and so, like as I said, some of them had never sold before. This is the McMansion era. This is actually built about 1914, 1917 from memory. Large blocks, corner allotment. On the opposite corner is a very large apartment complex with very large green spaces and off-street parking. Opposite corner to that, a church with no bells. Opposite corner to that is a large sports field. Massive green space again, brilliant location. Best thing about this property, if anybody has noticed, six bedroom, three and a half bath, almost 3,000 square feet. That means you've got three sets of tenants. It's what they call a triplex. You have one tenant move out, you've got two still paying rent. Two tenants move out, you've got one still paying rent. No matter which way you look at it, this is always producing some sort of return for you. Fact. These are some of the strongest types of investment that we get into. The triplex, duplex models are some of the best. You have one move out, you've got two still paying rent. Two move out, one still paying rent. You've got twice as many properties in the market for another tenant to come and have a look at. Moreover, in this region, is this type of property is what's being looked for. Okay, this is literally the type of property that people are trying to source. And it's hitting again comfortably 14% net. Okay. Um, this is an interesting property. This is one that uh, there was a small fight on. She's not here in the room. This is Lou's property. Anybody want to buy this right now? I'll slice 10 grand off it. She's not in the room, quick, quick. <laughs> Okay, this is uh, her first one. You know what? She didn't even realize this was a duplex. I'm not too sure if anyone else has picked that up. There's two doors there. Yeah, she saw what everyone else, I guess, is seeing, the net yield, 21% net, okay? I'm gonna go through the gross to net in just a second. This is, was bought for $49,000. Lou pays, I pay, Jamie pays what you pay, okay? Because we buy wholesale. We literally are buying these in bulk lots that most people would be frightened of the volume that we go through. It's three and two, so what it really is, is there's two bedrooms on the downstairs with one bathroom, one bedroom on the upstairs with one bathroom. <coughs> Excuse me. When you're actually looking for the gross to net yield, the things that we're actually taking out here is the property management. If you're a generic landlord in the US, your property management is 10%, okay? Our members, because of the volume, get 8%, and they get their own personal property manager. We actually take out a fudge factor of maintenance at 2%, the what if just in case. We take out taxes, we take out insurance, we take out every single possible variable so that you're not obviously confronted with a hard cost when you're actually getting into it. It's important obviously that when you're looking at a net return, that's a conservative net return. You'll expect that to go a little bit higher. But once again, I always round up or round down figures just to be able to give that realistic expectation. You never want to be able to pay out of your own pocket something that's supposed to be for an investment purpose. 
Atlanta, Georgia, after Phoenix was one of the other markets we got into because of the capital growth scenario. Now, this is an interesting city. Um, home of Coca-Cola, home of the CDC, the Center for Disease Control. It's a massive hub. I'm not too sure if anyone's been through Atlanta. It's a stunning place. Um, it's a bit like Melbourne, I guess, in the temperature range. Moreover, it has such a demand for both rental and for purchasing, even through the GFC, that it was just designed for investors. It was phenomenal. As we can illustrate here, we're actually beginning to get properties a little bit higher up in the margins that they were previously selling for. However, where we're looking at the current price, 59,400, right about the 60K, this property can now sell for 100 grand. About three, four months after we first got into Atlanta, another $500 billion hedge fund rolled in after us and started picking up properties faster than we could actually get rid of the ones that we were holding. They put such an impact onto the market, they spiked the property cycle again. Okay, so it hyperinflated the prices. It's one of the reasons we're no longer there. We can't justify paying more for a property from the banks that we buy them from, and competing with a hyperinflated market defeats the purpose. We're going to be hanging on to a property, if we bought this one, for example, at 60, we'd expect that to drop to 55, 54, 52, when that market cools back down when there's no other buyers apart from another big hedge fund that rolls through. A number of other factors, we don't actually go in there anymore. The key demographic that we were looking for is already back in the purchasing mode, okay? Because they've got the fastest rate of recovery from their financial side. They're actually getting approval for loans. The three and two, three bedroom, two bathroom, that's the small to young family. These are the people who've been working hard to repair their credit scores. These are the people who are literally putting themselves back in a position where they can get into home ownership. Great investment if you got into it at the time. Phenomenal investment. Our members are wrapped with these properties. Partially as well because they have some of the lowest vacancy rates. Indianapolis, home of the Indy 500. The Indy 500 race actually brings in about a quarter of a billion dollars in pure surplus cash to the city every single year. Not to mention the salaries, the jobs, the occupations, everything else that comes along with the supportive mechanisms of it. As indicated here, 12th largest city in the US. Out of 48 lower states, a big island being Hawaii and Alaska, which is horrible, don't go. This is probably one of the best cities in the US right now for industry of entrepreneurs. There are so many individual entrepreneurs in Indianapolis, it's ridiculous. It's basically a self-sustaining market. You look at Detroit, I won't draw this because they'll put me on the screen again. Uh, you look at Detroit, um, you'd be in a situation where, of course, you know, you've got the motor industry. They saw this back in the 50s when they could identify they could outsource that to a third world nation, make it cheaper to produce, make more money, bigger profits, yet they still folded. GM still went under. You get into a market where you've got a bunch of entrepreneurs, individual industrialists, one of them suffers, you've got 99 others that are still going to go through. Two of them suffers, 98 others that are still going to go through. Okay? So you've actually got a very large, self-sustaining metropolis. Duplex again, four bedroom, two bath. Now the net yields are sort of teetering around about the 16, actually 15 to 19 in this area, net return. Once again, everything factored into it. This property literally sold 2003 for $241,000. We got it for 70. Okay? To put a deposit down on that house, I remember paid 2,500, which is the same deposit for every property. Okay, so Joel, I want to go with this property. Not a problem. 2,500, a three-page contract, that's it. And the contract doesn't change, apart from the address and the purchase price. That's it. Joel, I've changed my mind, I want to get into another property. Not a problem. This goes back in the market, I take that same deposit, just transfer it from escrow to escrow, and do the same with the contract. And we can keep doing that all day long. It'll piss me off, but we can keep doing it all day long. <laughs> I've been doing this for a long time. It's not my investment, it's not my money. I was saying this when I set up a retail broking arm for a very large industrial firm here. It's not my time, it's not my money, it's yours. And this is why it's very important for me to be in this role so I can educate people how to do this without people like me, without people like the banks. Because realistically, they're all the same, just different colors. And I'll, sh I'll have so much fun walking around banks and I'm more than happy to show you how to do it too. This property recently sold to a very astute investor who, ironically, we've got a lot of investors from overseas. Even funny than that, some of them are American. They come through us to buy, because they can trust us. Okay, because we've got such a good name and brand in the industry, as Jamie had mentioned earlier, that obviously people know that for the next few years, we're still gonna be here. Joe, I've got a problem because uh, my property manager's gone on holiday. That's okay, it's Memorial Day. They'll be back. Leave a message or check on the portal. Whatever it is, they just call me. That mobile device right here, this iPhone, for example, never leaves my side, as the Minister of Finances is Skyping me now, telling me to do other stuff, which is interesting. But anyway, back to the presentation. $48,000 on this property was the price for it it sold for. <sighs> now we're gonna go into finance, which I absolutely drastically hate. What we're gonna have a quick look at here is two examples of Australian property, US property. Now if you were to take a half a million dollars 
from an Australian property, okay, which is the average purchase price of a good solid Australian property right now. And you're actually looking at a rental return of around about $2,000 per month. Okay, just running through this very quickly because these are numbers which bore everyone to tears. That's why we all have accountants. Um, we're looking at the property management, the insurance, rates, and, and extra provision. Everything is a hard cost that's associated just to holding and managing that property. And we're actually looking at the net rent after all those costs are factored of 4%. That's how much you're getting back, and that's generous. We're trying to be obviously generous to show you that you could get a great scenario out of the Australian market. At the interest rate of 6.75, that could be a comparison rate. Okay, comparison rates obviously factoring in every single type of fee above the base variable or the fixed, depending on what you're getting into. You're actually looking at a net position long term of 13,950. 13, 14 grand is how much you're out on that. If you have such a high salary, you need negative gearing, that's perfect. You might make a dollar a year and potentially capital growth in a declining capital growth market being Australia right now. Um, US property, you got say 100 grand. Do this with $500,000, it gets very exciting, but you do it with 100 grand. You look at your gross rent per month at 2K. We keep running right down the bottom here. The same exact variables, everything else considered, rounded up again for all those hard costs. You're looking at 18% net return. You're looking at close to about, about $11,500 a year profit. Simple. Everyone understand that? Except the guys in the AV table? Yeah, thanks, guys. Here's a couple of uh, different testimonials we've got from members. It's all well and good for me to tell you how great this investment is and how robust an investment it is, um, but we always take the blessed words of our members, obviously, to explain it. This, uh, this member actually, uh, I believe he actually came across with us, I can't recall, it was in Vegas. Um, but basically, he went across and he bought a couple of properties, paid in cash, obviously, for one of them, got a very high position. He was basically looking at um, obviously expanding that portfolio very, very shortly. But what we also try to do is make sure that when we're actually dealing with our members, it's specific to you. No two people we've ever dealt with out of the hundreds of members that we have have ever had the same buying requirement or therefore structured to hold them or therefore expected net return. So every single person is a case by case scenario, which is what I take a lot of pride in. Going into my other favorite. Okay, here are some quick options of how you can actually buy US property. Um, simplest one is cash, cash is always king. Line of credit, being obviously an LOC. If you're using superannuation or even the equity in your uh, existing home or investments, self, uh, superannuation being self-managed. Uh, other finance obviously being Australian finance, US finance obviously being an, uh, another interesting factor I'll, I'll touch on now. Two year interest only and 30 year principal and interest loans. I can get you, <coughs> excuse me, in three days time like literally it takes three days to get it approved, 50% uh, finance in any property. So let's say it's a $50,000 house, you need 25 grand of it. I'll get you the other 25 grand from the US. Doesn't impact your Australian credit score. I can get you a 30 year loan, which is a principal and interest. I can get that for you in a week. Interest rates on these, you're looking at around about eight, eight and a half, anywhere up to 12. 1% a month, all sorts of interest rates. It depends on your scenario, depends on the property, depends on the location but I can get your finance. Just take half of any property, and that's what you'd pay. Everything else can be done. The entry cost to getting into one of these loans, you're looking at anywhere up to about $3,000. That's just added to the amount you're borrowing. It's nothing you pay up front. You can pay down these loans at any time, okay, without a penalty, because that's already in that three grand up front. Okay, so it's already factored in. You're dealing with a person who used to be a finance broker. It's important, obviously, when I'm dealing with finance for my members, they're not going to get shafted like you'd find in any Australian bank. Okay, so I can pick and choose which finance companies we use. These are two of the best. You can get into it today, have it approved within anywhere between three and five days. You can close it out in a week's time, not be penalised. Okay? The best thing is, every single property that we ever deal with is below its current retail value. So if you're looking at a $3,000 cost to get involved, and you need that bridging finance for, let's say, six months, we use that get you in there, you close out that loan, you've still got an equity position that's absorbed the cost of that finance getting involved, okay? One thing, obviously, when you're going through and doing an accounting side as well, and I'll touch on this briefly because you've already gone through the lovely Warren Black, um, but one thing, obviously, to factor in again is whenever you're using any element of finance or any element of 
offshore uh, investment or even internal investment in this d domestic environment is to factor in where it's going to take you not just today but the next 12 months, two years, five years, ten years. So as Jamie, I think you would have mentioned today, I'm not too sure I didn't catch it, um, he should have gone backwards from the $2 million model. So basically you identify where you want to be in retirement age, like $2 million, and then use that cash obviously to liquidate. Joel, I want $2 million worth of asset and work backwards. And what's the safest way to do that? Warren and his team are probably the most gifted at being able to work with you one-on-one -on -one specifically to this. I can't actually give you personal financial advice. I can give you a map of how to do it. That's quite simple, but it has to make sense to you. And it obviously has to fit into a way that's not going to detriment your current taxation or your future taxation. So it's important that obviously you speak to those lovely gentlemen. Do not mention the Collingwood Football Club to Warren Black. He charges by the hour and you'll be there for hours. <laughs> okay? Um, you think I'm kidding. Like he does charge by the hour. Absolutely serious. Um, just quickly, obviously, tax structures. We've got US accountants, I've got US property managers, US inspectors. Um, you're going to need a limited liability company. We do everything for our members. More importantly, I'll show you how to do it. Okay, so in three years, that's how long our enrollments last for. You don't need me. Okay, the key of it is making sure that whatever it is, you've got the back end support for. AB guys are stepping with me again. Okay, we're going to have a look at a couple of quick properties that we saw when we were on tour just recently. Uh, this is a best example. Once again, I'm not going to show you the best and prettiest or the cheapest or the highest net returns. I'm just going to give you the most realistic examples. This is something you'd expect to find in Juan Turner, Baronia, Bayswater, etc. Brick. Okay, and once again, the building element will define where it's located. You'll get brick and clay in basically areas where there's clay. You get a lot of timber construction where there's areas where there's timber. Stone base floor where there's a lot of stone in the fields. It all depends on obviously where you're located. This is a fantastic property. It's 7.13 at $150,000. When you're looking at the estimated market peak at 110, okay, I'll give a lolly to anybody who can explain that to me, except for Daniel. No one? Bottom of the market? Pretty close, yeah. But this is actually, that estimated market peak was what it sold for, 2001. Okay, this, we actually picked this up for just under 145,000. We spent about six grand on it just to get it up to refurb mode. Because we buy in bulk, okay, we keep five to 10% of the properties. You guys get to pick everything else. The five to 10 will hold for five to seven, 20 years. Then we obviously release it ourselves. Okay, in this sort of a property though, we can actually sell this right now for about 190. Okay, it's a very strong position to have. Once again, four bedroom, two and a half bathroom. It's a family environment. This is designed specifically for a type of demographic. It gives you back $15,000 a year. Okay, happy little home. Indianapolis, I'm not going through all the Dallas. I'm not going through all the Indianapolis. I'm not going through Kansas uh, areas, St. Louis. I might touch on one, I think, a little bit later, but um, some of the key properties I'm gonna hit on will be the uh, Kansas City Greater that we'll actually touch on in a minute, about 50 to 70 block up to 112th Street, I think we're gonna go into as well. Uh, this is half of its pre previous purchase price. This is another duplex. This one uh, actually is tenanted on one side, vacant on the other. We've recently taken an application on the other side tenant. This actually recently sold, however, most likely what this client's going to do is going to flip it back out in the market because they can actually make a lot more than this right now. Okay, it's currently hitting just under the 17% net position. Very happy, healthy little property. Duplexes are, are just golden for that. This is Euclid in Kansas City. This is another example of just refurbed property. Uh, they do a little bit of landscaping out the front. They clean it up a little bit more. Three bedroom, one bath, 14% net yield. Once again, if I can get you finance on this property, you're looking at all up, maybe 25K that you'll put in to get it. So for the price of a car, you can get a home that'll actually pay you back as much as that car will depreciate, if not more, even though I do like my cars. We'll have a quick look around this property. Brick again, solid construction, new downspites. We go in and we replace everything, the new fans, new lighting, new carpet, new flooring. We paint the walls in a type of paint that's not gloss, not matte. It's a bit of a hybrid of the two. That way, when the kids come through, because remember, it's a family environment, Scratch down the walls of the crown, it wipes off easily. You don't have to repaint it, but I'll show you later in this photo set why we obviously keep the photos around. Kitchen, new bench tops, fridges, ovens, washers, dryers come standard as chattel with property in the US. Why? Because it's too hard to move. They just leave it there, okay? They all come with the property. When we go through, let's say, Joel, I want to get in this property. Not a problem. You sign a document that's three pages. You transfer an EMD, an earnest money deposit, that's 2,500 US dollars. It's like 50 cents Australian. The next thing we do, we order an inspector. 
straight away, and insurance take effect the day you take ownership. The inspector doesn't work for me, doesn't work for any of our network, they work for you. You can pull one out of the yellow pages, but just to make it easier the first time around or the second or third as many times, I'll do it for you. You'll pay for it, I'm not gonna pay for it for you. Uh, it's gonna be about two to $300, depending on the size of the property. Their job, because they work for you, is to find out what's wrong with this. They'll find something that even I couldn't pick up. And I'll walk into a brand new display home here in Melbourne, just finished today, and find 10 things wrong with it. Guarantee you. So their job is to pick out anything that isn't just a little bit loose or a little bit damaged or maybe just a question mark, something that's gonna cost you money in 15 years time. They'll pull it out. Moreover, whatever they find, and it could be the roof needs to be replaced, the plumbing needs to be replaced, the stove is just ugly and old, whatever it might be, I'll replace it or repair it because I've got warehouses full of stock. I've got warehouses full of kitchens, bathrooms, paint, supplies. I've got my own refurb teams. We do it all for you because what would cost you, let's say, $2,000 to refurb that kitchen costs me about 300. And tax modeling in the US means I can obviously offset my costs for doing that. Just makes sense. Once again, by doing it in a bulk format, we can obviously all benefit. Other side of the kitchen, brand new dishwasher in, the, in this, uh, just under the sink there. Why? It wasn't there before, it was a cupboard, but that's gonna attract your tenant a little bit faster. Probably cost me about $300 to get that in. You're gonna do that independently? Probably cost you about five to six. Okay, that's with the plumber fully installed. This is pretty much just the finished look. Uh, obviously this property is still vacant, this is just after refurb. You'll notice obviously these little tabs hanging down from the blinds, that's a federal requirement. It's anti-choking hazard, once again, for the demographic you're attracting. So the young kids don't get stuck in that. Hardwood floors. You put carpets down, you're steam cleaning those or you're replacing them every five to seven years. Hardwood, sand, polish, done. Paint, once again, obviously a mixed matte lacquer, uh, mixed matte uh, satin finish, easy clean. You can't really go wrong. <clears throat> brand new bathroom, brand new tile. What's the biggest requirement for most people when they're looking for a home, apart from a kitchen? What are they looking at? Bingo. That's why we spend most of the money in the bathrooms. This bathroom probably costs us up to about maybe 15 to 1800 bucks, okay? Not a bad looking bathroom. I do like that tile pattern, that's the only reason I put that photo in. Um, once again, these are brand new fittings, fixtures, this is exactly what they're looking for. Um, the brand new lino, everything's refitted. Go back another point, real quick, PowerPoint. Every single PowerPoint in the house is refitted. Why would you leave a PowerPoint, this probably was probably built in 1940, 1930 perhaps, if that PowerPoint had been in there that whole time, there's a chance that it's gonna break in the next three to five to 10 years. So we just go through and replace every single one of them at a cost of about 25 to 30 cents hard unit, plus probably maybe a dollar, the labor cost for us. It's just easier for us to do it straight away. But once again, your individual property inspector will check it, make sure it's not gonna short out or hurt or damage anybody, uh, just to be absolutely sure. Basement, which in Australia, unfortunately, is not used or utilized as a space often enough. It makes a brilliant wine cellar. I'm not too sure if anybody else has a cellar, but they're awesome. The key of it here, the reason we paint it white, is so you can actually track water and leakage. Okay, so that's intentionally white. If you're gonna have any type of leakage, that's gonna come through as like a rusty color, and you'll notice it straight away. Your property manager will be notified by the tenant if there's an issue there, and it gets fixed straight away. These foundations, in most cases, have been down there for 50, 60 years without any issue. <clears throat> we, every single property, I'll take a photo of the heating and uh, heating and cooling unit, as well as the hot water service. That is simply for the fact that you know that they're new and that they've got serial numbers and that obviously they're in a condition which is obviously ready to work, not gonna cost you any money or, or maintenance issues down the track. Brand new venting, brand new pipes, brand new um, filtration. And every single case, can of paint that matches the walls, because all the walls are the same color, except for one, maybe being off-white in the bathroom. That is so that when your tenant does scratch a wall, they are tenants, they are humans, they will damage stuff. They can go back and repaint it, because they don't want to lose their security deposit. Just makes sense. You, try, you basically have people that think about the human element every single which way. Cute little property. Very happy little property with lovely neighbors. Flipping on, we've got another one here at 50,000. This had never sold at the retail market. This was entirely owned since it was built by one family, so we don't have a price history on this, and I'm not gonna guesstimate one for you, okay? This is literally what the property is selling for now, is 50,000. We actually estimate this conservatively at about, just about 74 to 75K right now. I think we can probably get a little bit higher, but once again, I'm always conservative. It's always healthier just from a financial state being that way. 16% net, three bedroom, one bath, beautiful corner allotment. The view from this, and 
God bless them, the guys that we actually have in the States taking the photos, they play football. They don't always get the best angles for artistic endeavor, so I'm actually teaching them how to do it. I only recently got them to take out the date stamp from these photos, which was 1989, okay, and this was in 1989. So, but this actually looks out to a beautiful vista just over a park and into a creek. Lovely spot for any family to get into. South Benton in Kansas City, another great little property, 15% net return, three and two, off-street parking, alley at the back, brilliant property. This actually has a, uh, an expression of interest on it at the moment. Turn to the other side, because the neck's getting sore. Okay, so we're looking at obviously another condition of property now. The reason I included this one, once again, these aren't the prettiest properties, these aren't the cheapest properties, these are just run of the mill. The Australian investor looks at that and goes, ooh, bars on windows, looks like a dodgy area. An American tenant looks at that and goes, oh, bars on windows, safety and security. Okay, you're never gonna live in this house. Chances are you'll never even go there for a cup of tea. This is an investment. When you buy BHP sh shares, don't do it, but when you buy BHP shares, do you drop into the office and demand a cookie and a cup of tea? No. You just let the investment turn over as it should. Do you go to the AGM? Chances are you don't. Are you gonna pop in there and have a look at it? Go for it. Your property manager will drive you there from the airport. But the key being, don't make a purchase based on the way it looks. Make a purchase based on the numbers that it performs with. That's as simple as it gets in this sort of investment method. <coughs> Excuse me. Another interesting point here, in any area um, where you see these stairs, any area in the US you see stairs, they're not doing it for aesthetics, they're not doing it because they just couldn't be bothered digging the house down a little bit lower in the basement, they're doing it because it snows. Okay, now the last thing you want, if anyone's ever been to the snow, and I just came from a country that got about two foot in the space of around about eight hours, um, is the fact that you do not want to open the door and have to push the snow out of the way, you want to step down into it. If they color it red, so that you can see the ice that's condensed on those steps. Like these are all factored things that we educate you in so you understand what you're getting into. You can look at a listings, uh, listing site and be able to pick exactly what is a good property and exactly what is a bad property. And obviously make some astute investment choices. Olive Street, we took an expression of interest on this property today um, by one of our members. The expression of interest isn't a confirmed sale. So members can go in and basically put EOIs down on as many properties as they like and pick up as many as they want. Depends on obviously their circumstances. When our members start, they only ever start with one property. I've had people come up to me, Joel, I bought property in Spain before. That's great, lovely area, beautiful area. But at the same time, they've never done this in the US. So I'll only let them start with one. Go through all the basic processes, get it all done and dusted, get it closed, get the first, at least of the first rent come back, then go and get as many as you like. Just make sure it makes sense to you when you go through it. Our members are gonna be paying around $24,000 for this property, because the rest of it's on finance. $24,000, and it's gonna give you back 15% net return. Now, 15% net return is based on the fact that they're actually paying 41,200. If they actually put in $25,000, yet they're still getting the same rent, that net return goes up. Okay, so theoretically, that net return is gonna be sitting just about 16%. I don't do maths. My number two is an assistant accountant. I have so many accountants, it's ridiculous. But obviously, in a certain circumstance where you're looking to maximize your return, you're gonna use somebody else's money to do so. Okay, I'm gonna let you guys go in a minute here. I'm just trying to wrap this up as quickly as possible because everyone here needs a drink and obviously something to eat. I'll be here for the next couple of days. So if you wanna talk about any more of these ideas or any other country in the world that I invest, come and have a chat to me. But in an example of this at a property, these are your tenants. You won't find them spick and span. Let's go back and, no. When we actually had, um, where they had um, something on TV that was actually grossly inappropriate, my guy actually put that in there to be funny. But this one, unfortunately not. The one thing I did wanna point out in this photo though, the cats, now I'm allergic to cats, okay? Even though my partner actually works at a cat volunteer, plan. anyway, don't get me started. Um, now the, the thing about it is, you're gonna make more money because there's a cat sitting on the couch. I kid you not. The pet security deposit is one thing, the pet allowance is another. They'll actually pay you to bring their pet into this environment. Why do you care? You're never gonna go there. You've got hardwood floors for a reason, okay? They're not gonna make mess on the carpet that you're gonna have to steam clean for decades to get it out. You're just gonna wipe it up done, or somebody else is gonna wipe it up, and done. Okay, so these are all important things just to factor in. This is actually a, a cute little property. We we're actually quite happy when we got this one. This one uh, is actually one of my favorites at the moment. This was rented to, <sighs> unfortunately I didn't get this property because our members get first choice, but this is actually rented to a, a police uh, officer in the area now. He has a very high credit score in the US, but he has no buyer confidence in the US, so he's renting. He's planning to be in this property for three years. He's stationed at this current station for three years. He's two young children. 
and he chose this area as a police officer because it's a safe hub, it's a great area. He actually is gonna be getting uh, a little video testimony for us as to why he as an American is renting a property, why he obviously wants to go through this property manager because he's heard great things about them obviously, uh, all the other variables that obviously you would like as perspective for the people that will be paying you a return on your investment. These are the sort of transparencies that we enjoy giving you, okay? And this is obviously something that I strive for. Four bedroom, one bath, great property, very cute. Just missed it, unfortunately. One of the other things that our members obviously get uh, you know, a lot of access to is interactivity. And one of them obviously being me, 24 seven on the old uh, mobile device. Uh, you also get a, a large resource team back in the Australian office. You can Skype call any of your American contacts. You can get your property manager on the phone. You can get them on the Skype. They'll send you all sorts of lovely mail. Uh, you can talk to the refurb team. You can talk to some of our sourcing guys in the States. You can talk to everybody because they are your stuff. Okay, and we, once again, take a lot of pride in being able to give you that transparency. Most of our members don't expect that when they begin. Now they're at a point where they basically say, Joel, find this for me, just get me the documents. Okay, because that's what it's about. Let somebody else do the work for you. I have a 19 year old girl, 18 when she bought the property. She's never owned a car in this country. So she's never left the country. She's an international property investor. Okay, her mum recently asked her to move out because she wasn't gonna pay rent. I think that's hilarious. She's actually a lovely girl. She's gonna be doing another testimony for us as well. We might actually have her at our next financial education summit if I can convince her to come down. Um, but yeah, what I might actually do now, because I don't actually deal with uh, basically a lot of the general public, I deal exclusively with members. So just being able to get me back in the country for, for this event is something else. I'll bring Lou back up because she's gonna run through some of the elements regarding obviously what most of our members get. And this is pretty much what I discuss with all of our members day in, day out.